I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, we've got today and next week where we're going to be looking at different encounters that people have with the Lord, encounters with the Holy One. And we're looking at a very, a very awesome story today. It's a story of a guy by the name of, you might call him Naaman. In Hebrew, his name is Naaman. And so I'll probably say it both ways today, and I'm sorry for probably mixing and matching how you pronounce his name. Naaman or Naaman. And he, he's an important character in the beginning of 2 Kings. And, and really not just him, but the people surrounding him. So we're going to look at this morning at his story and how he comes to know the Holy One. Um, and as we do that, I just want to ask you, what drives your life? Like, like what drives your life? Um, maybe it's a, a passion for your work. Maybe it's a passion for for conquest. Like I, I ran past some uh, soccer fields last night, and there was conquest going on about how far they could kick the ball and everything. And I ran faster because I'm like, man, they're running so fast. I need to run faster. Um, may, maybe that there's something else in your life that 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 drives it. Maybe it's meaning finding meaning through charity and service. Maybe it's a pursuit of peace, whether it's relational or national or civic. Um, we're going to talk kind of about missions this morning. And a simple definition of missions, you could, you could say, is the pursuit of the worship of God within the whole world. I'll say that again. Missions is the pursuit of the worship of God in the whole world. When we partner with people in missions, and when we go out from this place as people sent by God to be missionaries to our culture, we are partnering with God that his name would be known in the whole world so that the worship of the Lord would increase. I love the way that John Piper says it in one of his books. He says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And so we're going to meet a guy by the name of Naaman this morning. And just a couple of contextual things. Um, Second Kings comes after First Kings. I know, brilliant. Um, Second Kings and First Kings are actually one scroll. I said this last week. They're written in around around 560 to 550 BCE is one of the common dates given for it. Um, but they take place throughout a several hundred year period, beginning with the end of King David's life and ending with Nebuchadnezzar coming and conquering the exiles in about 586. So as these are being written, the, the record of these events of all these kings of Israel has just come to a conclusion. And they're asking questions. The, the, the people who are first hearing this are in captivity and they're asking questions like, God, are you still in control? God, what do we do while we're in captivity? And what's the story of how we got here? And I shared this with you last week. I, I like the way the Moody Bible Commentary describes the purpose of the book of Kings. They describe it this way. A, it provides Israel a renewed opportunity to fear God, to live in devotion to him, and to look for the messianic king. And so there's a great passion that comes from this story, and a great passion that comes from these books about people experiencing God in a whole bunch of different ways. I want to invite you to stand with me if you're able. If you need to remain seated, that is absolutely fine as well uh, for the reading of the scripture this morning. We're going to read from 2 Kings chapter 5. <clears throat> Naaman, commander of the army for the king of Aram, was a great man in his master's sight and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was a brave warrior, but he had a skin disease. Aram had gone on raids and brought back from the land of Israel a young girl who served Naaman's wife, or Naaman's wife. Um, she said to her mistress, if only my master would go to the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went and he told his master what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Therefore the king of Aram said, go and I will send a letter with you to the king of Israel. So he went and he took with him 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 changes of clothes. He brought the letter to the king of Israel and it read, when this letter comes to you, note that I have sent you my servant Naaman for you to cure him of his skin disease. 
And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and asked, Am I God, killing and giving life, that this man expects me to cure a man of his skin disease? Think it over, and you will see that he is only picking a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel tore his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Have him come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Then Elisha sent him a messenger who said, Go wash seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. But Naaman got angry and left, saying, I was telling myself he will surely come out, stand, and call on the name of Yahweh, his God, and will wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin disease. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned, and he left in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, My father, if the prophet had asked you or told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more should you do it when he tells you, wash and be clean? So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times according to the command of God. Then his skin was restored and he became like the skin of a small boy and he was clean. <clears throat> then Naaman and his whole company went back to the man of God, stood before him and declared, I know there's no God in the whole world except in Israel. Therefore, please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, I stand before him. I will not accept it. Naaman urged him to accept it, but he refused. Naaman responded, if not, please let your servant be given as much soil as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will no longer offer a burnt offering or a sacrifice to any other god but Yahweh. However, in a particular matter, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master, the king of Aram, goes into the temple of Rimmon to worship, and I, as his right-hand man, bow in the temple of Rimmon. When I bow in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. Elisha said to him, go in peace. After Naaman had traveled a short distance from Elisha, Gehazi, the attendant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, My master has let this Aramean, Naaman, off lightly by not accepting from him what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw someone coming after him, running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and asked, Is everything all right? Gehazi said, it is right, my master, it's all right, my master has sent me to say, I have just now discovered that two young men from the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them 75 pounds of silver and two changes of clothes. But Naaman insisted, please accept 150 pounds. He urged Gehazi and then packed 150 pounds of silver in two bags with two changes of clothes. Naaman gave them to two of his young men who carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the two gifts from them and, and he stored them in the house. Then he dismissed the men and they left. Gehazi came, stood by his master. Where did you go, Gehazi? Elisha asked him. Your servant didn't go anywhere, he replied. But Elisha questioned him. Wasn't my spirit there when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is it a time to accept money and clothes uh, clothes, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, and male and female slaves. Therefore, Naaman's or Naaman's skin disease will cling to you and your descendants forever. So Gehazi went out from the presence, from his presence, diseased, white as snow. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for a story about how a Gentile, a commander of an army, comes to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God, for how that gives us great courage of your love and, and, and faith in your love, not just for the Jewish people, but for the entire world. And Lord, I pray this morning you would give us a love for our entire world, that we might desire passionately with great zeal to see the worship of God and the satisfaction that is found in you alone be experienced by those with whom we know and we love. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we're given this story, 
And, and it's helpful to note that while the Jewish people are in exile and they're asking, God, what are you doing? One of the things that is recorded in the story is a prayer by King Solomon. So King Solomon builds the temple, um, and it's a glorious temple. And as he's dedicating the temple, here's what I want you to, to, to I want you to read this. Um, here's what he says in 1 Kings 8. He says, even for the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, it says, for they will hear of your great name, mighty hand and outstretched arm, and will <clears throat> come to pray toward this temple. May you hear in heaven your dwelling place and do accordingly to all the foreigner asks you for. Then all the people on earth will know your name. Let me read that again. Then all the people on earth will know your name to fear you and your people, Israel, and know... Do and know that this temple I built is called by your name. The reason I share this with you is because while the book of First and Second Kings um, gives the story of how Israel is sent into exile because they did not worship Yahweh, um, here we find in our story today a great passion to share the name of Yahweh with a foreigner, and that's not. Um, that's not separate from God's mission to his people. Back in Genesis chapter 12, um, God says, I'm going to bless, Abram, all the peoples of the earth through you. And, and ultimately, that blessing comes through the Messiah, Jesus. It comes about knowing the name of God and who the one true God is. As I've said before, um, there's not a debate as to whether there were gods in the ancient world. The question is, is which God do you serve? And so many people would serve so many different gods. Um, they would serve gods like Baal or Ashtoreth. They might serve Zeus if you're Greek. And so the question becomes, which one do you serve? Here, even in the story, we find that Naaman goes into the temple of Rimen, which is one of these ancient gods up into the Aramean or Syrian area. And he says, my master goes in there. <clears throat> so he knows what worship is, but he learns in this story who is worthy of worship through an encounter of the Lord. And he learns this through the incredible love and care of God's people. I love the way that John Piper says this as well. He says this, missions exist because worship doesn't. And when we open the story here that's read for us, we're introduced to Naaman, commander of a great army. He's a great man in his master's sight. He's highly regarded. You, you get this idea that, whoa, this is a guy of great renown. And you come to um, this, you know, the Lord had given victory to Aram. Part of that was judgment upon Israel. <clears throat> and that says he was a brave warrior. This is all in verse 1. And then the very last phrase, after all these niceties, it says, but he had a skin disease. What started this whole story going is he gets a skin disease that probably separated him from culture and probably left him not very comfortable as well. In, in the Jewish culture, if you had a skin disease, the Torah talks about how you have to go outside the camp, then you have to be inspected by a priest because they don't want to spread the skin disease. And this is probably not leprosy because leprosy isn't noted until a couple of hundred years later in the literature. But still, this was something that separated him from um, the community. This is something that separated um, perhaps him from his family and perhaps even brought a quicker end to his life. And, and so you see, he's a great man. You see that the king has great great love and respect for him because he's willing to say, hey, I'm going to send a letter to the prophet, or not to the prophet, but to the king of Israel because we want to get this taken care of. But the person who acts as a very, very important agent of missions in this story is a girl. And she's a little girl. Uh, she's probably well under the age of 20. But she's, what we know is that she's old enough to know that she was taken off in a rage. She knows her people, Israel. She's a Jewish girl <clears throat> who serves Naaman's wife, and yet she has a love for people, right? Uh, put yourself in this girl's place. You've been taken and carted away from your people. 
in one of these raids that probably Naaman was involved with. They go along, they take people to help them as slaves or as servants, and she's serving his wife. And she finds out that her, her mistress's husband, Naaman, has a skin disease. What would you do if you'd been separated from your family, if you're in a country that's not your own, and you know that the person, one of the significant people who was probably responsible for what just happened in the last course of decade of your life is sick, what would you tell them? Would you be, serves them right? Would you just stay quiet? Notice what she does. This is, by the way, the only little story we get about this one person. And it says, Aram had gone on raids and brought back from the land of Israel a young girl who served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would go to the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. In this, she has a couple of we, we learn something about her in this literally one sentence that we're given. One of the things we learn is that she has a compassion for people. Second thing we know is that she knows where he can get help. She doesn't send him to the witch doctor down the street. She doesn't send him to someone who might be able to help. She says with confidence here, if only, if only my master would go to the prophet right? Not just to any old prophet. She knows who she's sending him to, I think. She's, she knows about what God's prophets have been doing and, and how Yahweh can bring healing, not through ritual, but bring healing through his power. She says, send him to the prophet who is in Samaria. He will cure him of his skin disease. Uh, imagine if you sent a person, hey, go there. They will cure you of your skin disease. And you were to go there, and they were not to cure them of their skin disease. Like, she has such great confidence in the prophet. And she has even greater confidence, confidence in who the prophet represents, Yahweh. Missions exist because worship doesn't. She, I submit to you, is a missionary to her field. She doesn't tell the whole story in that one sentence that we get, but she tells enough that Naaman, who is desperate, has probably tried almost everything, goes to the king and he says, so I've got a servant girl from Israel. She tells me, I need to go see the prophet in Samaria. And the king says, do it. I'll write you a letter. And so on the one part, we get this picture of a girl who, who has a love and a passion and a zeal for God, but she also has a heart of mercy towards people who may not have even been merciful to her. That's, that, that is just an incredible quality of a follower of Yahweh. So here's kind of where we're at. This map is a little hard to see. I have another map I'm going to show you in a minute. Down here in Samaria, in the, in the left, lower left-hand part of your screen, um, this is where the prophet Elisha is at. Where we are at now is we're going up all the way through Damascus and we're going up into Syria. So it's a several, several mile journey, right? Um, here's the city of Damascus today. Th this is the place where um, Naaman is most likely at. It's at a place where there's the Par 4 and the other river. Where is it? Uh, the other one, the Abana and the Parfa rivers go east and west, and they go through the center. One of them goes through the center of Damascus. Here's another way to look at it. This is a Google Earth map. So you have down in this area, you have Israel. You've got the Sea of Galilee right here. And you have Damascus, Syria is where they're from. They're, they're Arameans from up in this area. So um, he is up here. Naaman's up here. He's going to come all the way down, probably following something like that route. And he's going to come down into this area down in here of Syria, or not of Syria, but of um, Samaria. And he's going to come and he's going to find the prophet. Now the king does what a king does. He sends him to another king. Because if you're a king, you're not going to say, go find the prophet necessarily. Uh, you're going to say, hey, go find the king. The king's going to take care of you. And if he doesn't, perhaps maybe we'll have a chat. And so he sends him with this letter. And what we see from the 
the Aramean side is he's sending them with a request. Would you please heal my commander? When the king of Israel gets this, the king of Israel reads the letter and he goes, he tears his clothes, a sign of public mourning. And he goes, what am I supposed to do with this? I can't cure this guy. And so the king of Israel thinks that um, Naaman's king is picking a fight with him. Totally plausible because these two parties have been going back and forth, raiding and fighting off and on. They're friends, then they're not. They're friends, then they're not for the last several years. So he's thinking, they're trying to get me into something here. Right? So here's where they're at. Damascus is right here. This is up in the north. We've got the Parfa River. We've got the Abana River going on here. Now, he comes to the king. I'll leave it on this screen for just a minute. He comes to the king down in Israel. And <clears throat> the king tears his clothes. And, and then we, we find out in verse 8 is that Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel tore his clothes. So it was a big deal that the king of Israel oh, just utter despair, utter mourning, like, what am I going to do about this? They want me to cure this guy. Elisha hears about it. So he's probably somewhat nearby, but certainly the, the word of a king tearing his clothes um, passes pretty quickly throughout the city. And he sends a message to the king, and he says, why have you torn your clothes? Have him come to me. Notice what he says. Um, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now, a prophet is a person in the Hebrew Bible who stands and speaks for Yahweh, right? So when he says that, that he will know that there is a prophet in Israel, he's not saying, hey, look at me, I'm a prophet. He's saying there is one in our land who will speak on behalf of Yahweh, and I am one of those who will speak on behalf of him. When he says, have him come to me, Elisha's not doing some sort of magic hocus pocus um, on his own merit. He's, he's going to be telling Naaman something to do, and it's going to be tied with the healing that can only come from Yahweh. So when you hear him say, he will know there is a prophet, it's he will know that there is a God in Israel. That's what he's saying, and that's what the text later means. And it, and it says that for us pretty plainly. So <clears throat> notice what happens. What you would expect to happen is Naaman goes to see Elisha. Elisha comes out. This is what Naaman thinks. He's going to come out. He's going to wave his hand. He's going to do something. And then I'm going to be healed. Naaman comes to Elisha. Elisha does not come out. He sends a servant. <laughs> now, imagine you are a commander of an army, one of the biggest armies in all of the world at this time, and the person that you're going to go see doesn't bother to even come out. You'd be a little like, you got to be kidding me, right? Like, doesn't he know who the king I serve is? Doesn't he know who I am? And the answer is, of course, Elisha does. What's going on here? Well, we'll, we'll find out. Um, Naaman comes with his horses and his chariots, and he stands at the door. Elisha sends him a messenger, verse 10, who says this, Go wash seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. One sentence. Go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times. Your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. When he's talking about clean here, he's talking about you will become in a state of ritual cleanliness. That's the way a Jew would read it. They would be like, oh, he will be clean, which means, oh, he will be of an ability to come. For the Jew to be clean, they'd, they'd go through ritual cleansings um, fairly frequently, and, and they would do that on their way up to the temple to worship. Actually, archaeologically speaking, there's a whole bunch of, they're called mikvaot. There's all these ritual immersion pools all around the temple mount where people would go in, they would cleanse themselves as they walked through the waters, and there's specific things about that. Then they would be able to go up into the temple and they'd be able to worship. So when he's talking about go wash yourself in the Jordan, that's a place where you could be ritually washed because it's a water being moved by the hand of God. And, and they would go down there and they would be ritually cleansed. He's sending them down there and he says, I want you to go cleanse yourself seven times and you will be clean. There's a lot of confidence with that. Here's a photo of a baptism, which, which is kind of on this similar idea, but it's separate from what's going on, but it's a nice visual. This is from 1903 in the Jordan River. Um, so here we have Naaman. He gets these words, 
And not only, I think, is he offended that Elisha doesn't even bother to come out, he's offended that he would ask him to do something so low and so trivial as go and wash in a dirty river in Israel seven times. And really, that's all it takes to be clean? It actually says in verse 11, but Naaman got angry and he left saying, I was telling myself he'll surely come out, stand and call in the name of Yahweh, his God, and will wave his hand over the spot and he will cure the disease. Aren't Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he starts justifying. He starts saying, what about if I were to do this instead? What, what about if I took this path instead? Why did they tell me? Why did he tell me, go to the Jordan, wash seven times, and you will be clean? He's, he's all um, keyed up here. It says, so he turned and he left in a rage. Verse 13, notice the servants here. If your master's in a rage, I would imagine you're going, what do I say? What do I do? Do I want to enter this one? Nope, we're going to let him be in a rage. I don't know. But notice what they said. The servants approached and said, my father, a, s- a sign of respect here. If the prophet had asked you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Right? He's probably going to travel about 40 miles from Samaria to the Jordan River. So it's not a small travel. It's not a, hey, go jump into the pool over there. He's going to have to do a little bit. He's saying, I'd be willing to go all the way back up to Damascus. Why didn't he tell me maybe to do that? Aren't they better waters? His servants say to him, "Uh, how much more should you do it when he tells you to wash and be clean? Apparently that was convincing. And it says in the text that Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times according to the command of the man of God. Notice what happens. Then his skin was restored and he became like the skin of a small boy and he was clean. Imagine watching your master go through this whole thing. Imagine being Naaman going through months of this skin disease, this life-stopping event looking for um, help from everyone you could find. I'm sure that they probably, well, I, I'm likely certain, let me put it that way, I'm likely certain that they probably exhausted every resource they had up in Aram. They exhausted every known person who might be able to do a spell or an incantation, who might have some sort of potion or oil. They tried all the natural remedies. They tried all the pills. They tried every quick fix or long fix that they could. And they go down here. It's a simple thing. And he just braces. I don't want to do the simple thing. And there's something in there within his pride. There's something there within himself where he's like, why are they telling me to do this? And yet it's through this that he begins to encounter the Holy One. Because it's through this, the simple act given by a man of God to this Gentile to say, go wash seven times in the Jordan and you will be clean. Now, he didn't meet um, Elisha the first time around because Elisha just sent a messenger. The second time around, here we have um, him coming back to meet Elisha. So Naaman and his whole company went back to the man of God, stood before him and declared, notice what he declares, I know there's no God in the whole world except in Israel. Just imagine you're the ancient Aramean gathering around. You've just seen this thing and now a significant person within the military of the king in which you serve and who serves other gods, the king does, says, I know that there is no other God in the whole world except in Israel. It's almost like Solomon's prayer in part is being fulfilled in one of the many small ways that, that people of the earth, that the nations, that the Gentiles would know the name of Yahweh. That they would know who really heals, who really restores, who really redeems and saves. Notice what Elisha does. Uh, he, he's given 
this gift, right? Like he brought stuff to give, and this is not small stuff. Like the stuff that he brought, I did the math earlier this week according to the current gold standard because I'm just weird like that, and it was something like $4.7 million in today's currency worth of gold, and it was something like uh, uh, $600,000 worth of silver um, and 10 changes of clothes, right? Um, This is not a small thing. In the ancient period, this would have set a lot of people up for life. Like, he's bringing nuggets of gold. These are nuggets found in Cyprus from around this time. He's got bags of this stuff, you know, hundreds of pounds. It takes servants to help Gehazi in the following story carry this all up to his house. This is a lot of weight. They're, they're lugging this stuff as a way to give it. I think he probably thought there's going to be payment rendered. I mean, you go to a doctor, you get the bill. It might as well be, you know, 750 pounds of gold sometimes. And you just go, here it is. <laughs> Here's all I have. They're taking so much stuff. I think he's taking it because he's expecting this is not going to be free. This is going to cost me something. He's healed. He comes back and he says, here, I want to give this to you. And Elisha says, stop it. As the Lord lives, verse 16, I stand before him. I will not accept it. That's a big deal in Eastern culture, by the way, to not accept a gift that someone wants to give you. Like, that, that's bordering almost on rude. And not only that, so like, you, you see Middle Eastern culture going on here. Uh, ne- Naaman urged him to accept it, but he refused. Imagine you have, like, uh, later he tells Gehazi, Elisha tells Gehazi, um, you know, gold and silver, money, clothes, orchards, vineyards, sheep, ox, and male and female slaves. Like, these resources, even the small amount that Gehazi ends up taking with him later, would have set him up for life and life and life. It would have given him everything he could ever want. And yet... The prophet who serves Yahweh says no. Why does he say no? Why does he say no? I think one of the reasons he says no is because God is not a genie. And God is not a healthcare practitioner. God is a great lover and giver of good things. What the Lord shares with Naaman by cleansing him was not something Elisha did. It's something God did. And for Elisha to take money and to take status and to take symbol all of a sudden elevates Elisha. It's not about Elisha. It's about God. Even more, the greatest gifts that God gives to you and I and he gives to his people throughout all of history have always been free. It's just how God works because he loves you and he loves me and he loves the world. Imagine if when you came to receive Christ as your Lord in your life, God said, all right, that'll be a payment of. (laughs) If we did that, if we operated in that mindset, what we have now is a contract, not a covenant. What we have now is something that maybe we can deserve or something we can earn or something we can achieve. But the very nature of grace is, as we sang this morning, marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe. Free. It's one of our favorite garage sale signs, right? You put something out, you put free on it. It gets snagged up almost every time. The most amazing gift God has to give you and I His son, Jesus Christ, is free. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't barter for it. You can't even give a gift for it necessarily. Now, does it demand something from you? Yes. I love the way that the hymn writer writes, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Right? It demands something for you. 
but it doesn't demand out of contract. It demands out of love. It, it demands in the way, like when I said to my wife 17 years ago, our wedding vows, that was not a contract, that was a covenant. That was a, we are in this relationship together. And it's a covenant of love. You can't earn it. I can't earn it. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I really don't deserve it. <laughs> it's how God loves. And it all starts with a girl who is more concerned about the life of her master than she is with her own situation. And it moves on to a king who sends another king a letter, heal my servant, and a man of God who says, I know you can't do that king, but I know a God who can. The king should have known God can do this. <laughs> but he didn't. But Elisha says, I know a God who can. And so Elisha says to Naaman, after all this is done, I don't want your stuff. But notice how Naaman responds. He responds, verse 17, If not, please let your servant be given as much soil as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will no longer offer a burnt offering or a sacrifice to any other God but Yahweh. Right? He's saying, I, I live up in the north. You guys have a temple down here to Yahweh. Let me take some dirt from this hallowed ground in which Yahweh resides. Let me take it back. Let me put together an, an altar of offering so that I too, like you, may worship the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, God does not live in a temple per se. Um, he dwelt in a temple for a time. In our time right now, he dwells in his people by the Holy Spirit. Like the way Paul says it in the New Testament, he says, you are the temple of the living God. So it works a little bit differently, the, the theology of place from Old and New Testament. But what Naaman is saying here is he's saying, I no longer want to serve the gods of Aram. I, never, don't, I no longer want to serve the god of Rimen. I know I'm the right-hand man. I know I'm going to have to accompany my, my master into there. It's part of my duty. But that's not what I'm worshiping. That's who I'm not. That's, I'm not worshiping Rimen. I'm a worshiper of Yahweh. And notice what it says. He, he asked for pardon for that. And then um, Elisha says to him, go in peace. So, so we're given this, this picture of a guy commander of an army, greatly powerful, greatly wealthy, who comes not just to be healed, to get the skin resolved. He comes to have his heart cleansed. He comes to find faith in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What's so interesting is you have this Gentile, and th that's important because um, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is in Nazareth, his hometown, and he uses this story to describe how the people of Israel, sometimes they, they saw all the things that Yahweh was doing around them and they just didn't believe. And he says in Luke chapter 4, he cites two references where God did things, one with Elijah he healing a, a boy, and one with Elisha bringing healing to a, a, a man, both of them Gentiles. And one of the things that underscores for us is that God has a heart for all people, right? It's not just about the Jewish people, although God works through the Jewish people and is working through the Jewish people to share the message of the gospel. But he cares about the Gentiles as well because every person is a person made in the image of God, of inestimable worth and value in his sight. And so he comes here, and, and the Jewish people are reading this going, this is a pagan who's coming to know the Lord. But notice what happens to the Israelite in the next story. I'll just recap it briefly. Gehazi, Elisha's servant. And, and if you read in the chapters surrounding this, you're going to find lots of miracles being recorded. Gehazi has likely seen a lot of these things. He looks at Elisha and goes, whoa, 
There's a lot of things going on. The next story is a floating axe head. Like, it's kind of crazy stuff. You back up to the story, uh, the stories right before this, there's bread that's multiplied. There's a stew that everybody's like, it's poisonous, and uh, Elisha does something, and he's like, you're fine to eat it. It's okay. The gourds aren't going to kill you. Um, he's seen incredible things done in Yahweh's name and on behalf of Yahweh. But how does he respond to this? Here, this Jewish servant sees his master say, I want nothing. And Naaman goes away, and Gehazi quickly runs after him, and he says, oh, by the way, and he concocts the story about two people who come, and his master wants him to get this and this and this. And Naaman's more than happy to give. Like, like he's kind of a, the innocent bystander in this story. What it's focusing on is here's a Jewish servant who has seen the amazing works of God and yet would rather have the safety and the security and the prosperity that comes through silver and clothes rather than see the name of Yahweh worshipped and made famous throughout the world. So you get this great contrast between every character in this story. You know, you go from young girl in the beginning to powerful um, commander. You go here to a person who should know better, who has seen how God has worked, who knows who Yahweh is, who knows what Yahweh can do, but would rather be comfortable with the physical pleasures of life. He'd rather be set up materialistically rather than have the name of Yahweh exalted. John Piper, I shared this with you earlier. He says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. He goes on in a book that, that he wrote on missions, and he says, according to Romans 15, there's two things that drive the heartbeat for mission. You know, the, the advancement of the worship of God. There's two things. Number one is a zeal for God. And the second one is a heart of mercy or compassion for others. What we see in people like Elisha and we see in people like this young girl, they have a zeal for God. But they also have a heart of compassion and mercy for others. Why? Because they know who their God is. That he is rich in mercy. That, that he's compassionate and gracious. That he is slow to anger and abounding in love. They know who their God is. But they don't want the message of Yahweh to stop with them. They want it to go to all the earth. What fuels missions, according to John Piper? A zeal for God and a, a burning passion and compassion and heart of mercy for others. I was, I was thinking about this while I was running last night because I'm running past these soccer fields and <clears throat> it's getting dark and they're playing under the lights and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of passion going on out there. I mean, the, the, the first field I came upon, there was a coach who was ripping the ref a new one because one of his players got hurt. I don't know what happened. I don't know whether it was justified, but there was zeal going on, right? It was, it was zealous. I get to the next field and there's a kid who, who's in the goalie box. He's the goalie. He's getting ready to come out of the goalie box. He's trying to get that ball and clear that out. There was zeal because there was another player coming the other way. There's zeal and there's passion. Um, um, I go around um, Helder Park on my run, come to the next thing, and there's another kid who's just running all out because they're leaving it all on the field, right? I reach another one, there's a kid limping, you know, his zeal was a little bit hurt for the night. Um, I, I reach another one, and, and they're just kind of watching the ball. They're being smart soccer players, don't run unless you have to. But I'm running this, and my pace is picking up because I'm going, my goodness, they're running fast. My goodness, they're all young. I got to run faster. You know, it kind of it increased my zeal for running last night as the darkness came as well. Um, but it's not just about zeal. It's about having a heart that God has, having God's heart for people. What fuels missions is being so satisfied in God that you go, can I tell you how I received mercy? Uh, Elisha didn't give anything that he didn't already receive. The girl didn't give anything that she did not already receive. 
I was thinking about it last night. What, what causes or what propels zeal? Is it just I'm going to work harder? I don't think that lasts very long because eventually our energy runs out. Is it just I, I have to do better? I don't know. Is it some sort of, of moral list of check marks? I, I don't know. I don't think so. I think, what, I think what helps promote zeal for the Lord is tied with that second phrase from Romans 15. Knowing how much you and I have been forgiven is like the other side to zeal. John puts it this way in one of his epistles. He says, we love, and, and love is an action. It's not an emotion, it's an action that works on behalf of someone without expecting anything in return. It works for their good. We love, John says, because he first loved us. I think what pushes our zeal for the Lord, if you find your zeal tank a little low this morning, remind yourself how much God loves you. Remind yourself how much mercy God has shown you. Mercy, by the way, cannot be, cannot be earned. It's something that's given freely. Elsewhere, the scripture says it this way, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Some of the best, one of the best ways that you and I can serve as God's hand and feet in our world is to say, you know how incredibly good and merciful and kind God is. And here is how he has been kind to you and to me. He sent his son, his only son, the one whom he loved. He put everything on the line. He became a sin offering so that you and I could become the righteousness of God through faith. So that as he rose again, we have the hope that we will too rise again. We didn't earn it. We can't deserve it. And yet he gave his life away. As the song says, oh, the amazing, never-ending love of God. Do you know that love this morning? Where's your zeal this morning for the Lord? If your zeal tank is low, go back and remind yourself of what God's word says about how much he loves you and what he has done to save you and I from a life of sin and the life of bondage and a life of slavery. And then go and share that message. Why? Because God's glory God's glory, he is most glorified in us when we find that he is all that we need. When we find that he is our life, he is our satisfaction, he is the prize. That's how much God loves you. And that is the love that propels us as his people into a world that's broken and hurting. Pray with me, please. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring the right application to each one of our lives this morning. God, some of us need to have a grander vision for missions, the worship of God in the whole world. So some of us, God, admittedly, our, our, our hearts and our actions are consumed with things like Gehazi. We're a little more concerned about the, the, the silver or the clothes or the things of this world and how we will stay secure and prosperous. And Lord, we, we, we come this morning and just confess that, that, that that's wrong thinking. And we come back, Lord, to your perfect provision of grace in our life. When we were still sinners, at the right time, Christ died for me. And Lord, help me to never get over that amazing, simple truth. Help me to never, to never be finished pondering and living in light of the incredible love of God. And Lord, for those of us this morning who, who find ourselves maybe even in relationship with you, but we think we can earn, we think we can deserve, Remind us that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Lord, show us where we are prideful in our own ways, where we're trying to, to make a name for ourselves, or we're trying to achieve in order to be made right in your own eyes. 
God, bring conviction to our hearts for people who are far from you in our lives. People who maybe don't look like us, people who don't come from the same background as us, but people for whom you died. May the zeal, may our zeal for you in our received, our reception of mercy move us more and more to a worship of you this week, God, that would make the name of Jesus famous in our lives and in our world. We pray in his name, amen.